session today is about empowering journeys. When the conference organizers reached out to me and invited me to join this panel, I felt that uh, the topic of the session is, resonates with me very deeply. First of all, as a female leader in technology, I'm always looking out for other extraordinary women as role models. And also, on the other hand, uh, after being for several seasons uh, mentoring technology for other women, I, I, I'm aware how important this topic is for many of you. Uh, throughout those sessions, one of the most frequent questions was, what should I do next? How often do you think I was asked this question? All the time. Every <laughs> single time, exactly. <laughs> So I'm really, I'm really privileged today to share the stage with these extraordinary women and I'm looking forward to hear about your journeys and about your experiences. So um, let's start with the first question. I will ask each of you to introduce yourselves and to share with us about um, a significant turning point in your career and how did it propel you into leadership role and to your success? Hi, everyone. Eileen Page, SVP of Digital and Technology Innovation at Envision Communications. We're actually on the agency side, so whereas many of you are coming from premier tech brands, a lot of these brands are actually our clients. And what we do for them is we're an audience engagement solutions agency. One of the key ways that we engage our various audiences is through live events. So a pivotal point in my career was, of course, COVID, when we went from being able to be in ballrooms with 400, 4,000, 40,000 people to everything being completely shut down. Of course, this was an incredibly challenging time in our business. At the time, we didn't have digital representation on the senior leadership team. So I saw my opportunity and I grabbed it. We took a really strong stance, of course, in partnership with our strategy teams, the entire agency, and really were bold about how we approached transferring our clients and prospective clients' live experiences to digital. And that experience has carried us, has carried us through today when sometimes remote does make more sense than face-to-face. -face. So we had to make some really tough decisions. Did we partner up with a specific virtual event platform like many of our competitors did? We made the choice to stick with our technology agnostic stance, which meant we went out and found the best technology solution for our clients. So all along the way, there were opportunities for me to step up, do the role that I'm doing now, kind of before I was officially promoted into it. But I had the opportunity as well to build the team. We had a small team when COVID began, and we didn't necessarily have the budget to hire a new team of digital experts or acquire a digital agency. So all of us really were incredibly flexible, incredibly nimble in what we were charged with and what we were helping our clients ultimately to achieve. And so pulling from different parts of the organization, recognizing top talent, recognizing those who had the self-starter mindset, the proactivity to really embrace this new change. And again, it's really carried us through. We're still using our learnings and I'm certainly using my learnings of being fearless to, um, Carrie's point, don't apologize. Instead of saying, I'm sorry for being late, say, thank you for your patience. I had to pee after six straight hours of calls. So, has, <laughs> any, of, has any of you experienced the same? Like, yeah, Keeping that bold and fearless mentality and ultimately um, embracing change and not being able to, not being afraid to take risks. Hello, everyone. My name is Surbi Kaul, and I'm still reeling from that very vulnerable presentation by Carrie. Um, it was beautiful. So in the vein of vulnerability, I'll share a little bit about myself. Um, I have been in the Valley working in the Bay Area for about 20, 25 years, uh, going with age, right? Age is just a number. <laughs> and uh, I have been in product management most of my life. Um, I have, my background is engineering, like Carrie. I think a lot of things resonated with what Carrie was saying. I was one of, you know, five women in my class of 400 boys in engineering school and felt totally isolated and, you know, felt left out in many of the things. And here we are with, uh, uh, you know, extraordinary women here. So excited, so proud today to be here with all of you. 
Um, a pivotal point in my career was when I transitioned from product management into customer experience. I had this opportunity, and like Yulia was asking, when do you think about what next? We think about it every day, all the time. We, are, we learn to hustle at a very young age. And so you're hustling. You're like, what next? Do I want to do a board? Do I want to write a book? Somebody talked about it. We're always thinking, and this opportunity came along to do customer experience I don't know anything about customer experience. What does that mean? I have built products. I know how to build customer-centric products, but taking a charter of a large $10 billion company and leading customer experience, I did not know much about it. But I'm like, fake it till you make it. So I entered that interview room, and I'm like, yeah, of course I can lead customer experience. Why not? And so here we are two and a half years later, and I'm loving it. I love the learning. I learned, learned on the job, and uh, I produced results, and data spoke for itself. And uh, now I am leading some of the Gen AI initiatives that I was sharing with some of the ladies yesterday. So very excited to be here to share some of those learnings with you. Be vulnerable, share, support you all, support you know, our panel. And thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amy Yee. I come from a company called SE Health. SE Health focuses, it's a non-for-profit uh, social enterprise in Canada. We've got about 8,000 healthcare workers in the field going to people's homes. We're focused on home care uh, and transforming the future of aging. Um, and we, our mission is, it sounds cheesy, but it's true, we're bringing hope and happiness. Um, so that's, uh, that's our company and what we do. Um, this is my second time as a chief digital officer. Uh, my first time was uh, with a health standards organization, and so very familiar with sort of the idea of transformative organizations from the perspective of having sort of technology, people, process all together. So it's always a, a fun adventure and, and a really interesting uh, place to be uh, for an organization. I think a pivotal moment for me, um, and thinking about, you know, Carrie's keynote as well, is just whenever I have sort of thought about what I want to do and who I am and what I don't want to do. Um, when I made the switch to healthcare, um, I'm also an engineer by background, um, and when I made the switch to healthcare, I realized that's, that's what I wanted to do. That's where I wanted to make a difference and, and to have an impact. And I applied for a job that was not really what I was looking for, but it was, a, it was you know, and I sat there and I got the interview and it was going really, really well. And I realized, you know what, I'm not going to be the best person for this job. And so I did what was not expected of me, um, and I was raised to do everything that everyone expected of me. But I sat there and I said, you know what, don't hire me. I am not the best person for this job. I will help you find the best person for this job. I am more than happy to do that. Uh, I will cruise my network and I'll find that person. Um, but if you are looking for someone to help you transform your organization and to work with people and to change your organization to something completely different, then I would love to help you with that. And so I went away, and then the next day I came in, and there was an offer uh, in my email for chief digital officer. It's not a rule that they had ever had before. Uh, it was the, so it was inaugural. They, they, you know, they created it. They created an executive position. And I didn't know what a chief digital officer was uh, because it was early on. There weren't that many of them. Um, but I thought it sounded great, and I, and I took it. And they didn't know what to do with me at first, but we figured it out um, and built out a department out of it. And it was a lot of fun, but it was really just you know, stopping and thinking about, you know what, wait a second. Even though I really wanted to get into healthcare, it's like, this is not really who I am or what I want to do. What is my value and what is it that I want to offer? And taking the risk of being rejected uh, and being okay with that. And so uh, that was one of my pivotal, pivotal moments. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Rama Akiraju. I lead the enterprise AI and automation at NVIDIA. So in my role, I get to play with the latest NVIDIA chips that are so hard to find these days. <laughs> There's a long queue from all AI companies out there. So I get to play with them. I get to build uh, on the latest large language models, building employee productivity type of tools, chatbots, cybersecurity models, improving operational efficiencies for IT and business productivity uh, models and those sort of things, all with AI. Super excited about what I do at NVIDIA. Prior to joining NVIDIA about a year ago, I was uh, at IBM much of my career. I was an IBM fellow and a CTO for AI for IT operations. 
I, in my career, I worked at IBM Research. I started out in research, doing research for a number of years, building a lot of uh, cool research technology. Then I was in part of IBM's Watson division, which was um, uh, the AI, the original AI, when it, got, it all got started in the product division. And, um, and that's how my journey has been. So I was thinking about what would be a single turning point. I would say, actually, every day, from the time I joined workforce at IBM Research has been a turning point. Because we are, I believe, we are a sum of all the experiences that we accumulate over time. And so early on, I got to, at IBM Research, I got exposed to you know, people who are Turing Award winners. I had lunch with somebody like Fran Allen, who is considered to be the, the godmother of uh, you know, compilers who, who in, you know, innovated on optimizing compilers. I, I sat at lunch table with uh, the likes of Mandelbrot, who invented fractals, who is considered the god in mathematics. Um, and so, so many other Turing Award winners. So I got to see and get inspired by all of those folks. And I strongly believe that the turning point in each of our lives is about really what inspiration we take from people who we look up to, and from also from people whom you may not necessarily agree with always, but take something that's positive from them and imbibe all of those qualities over time into your own leadership style and keep the ones that align with your values. I look up to people who, who lead uh, with a lot of grit and grace. I imbibe those qualities but I leave out things that don't align with my values. If somebody is using curse words, for example, that's not my style. I would never do that in my life. I, I leave out that part of it, but everything else about that person in, inspires me, I take and imbibe. So to me, the turning point is, is really about that every day paying attention to who you are inspired by and what, what you need to do that aligns with your values and, and shaping yourself and continuously you know, evolving. And that's... That's my turning point of everyday story. Thank you. So if I may summarize what I've just heard. So the factors or the turning points can be different for everybody. So we all have our own turning points. They can be external, like COVID, that transformed lives of, of most of us. It can be internal need to try something new, to uh, move from being on the product side to become a customer and become an, work on the customer side. Maybe something that you feel that you want to try a new challenge and you want to create a job that fits your internal pursuits the best. And of course, everyday learning and trying new things and uh, exploring where your strengths are and where you want to go. And having said that, uh, since you are remarkable and you're extremely successful, um, of course, achieving this would not be possible if you haven't demonstrated a lot of resilience and strength. And my next question will be about it, and I will ask uh, Rama and Sorbi. Uh, in your career, have you navigated challenges and setbacks? And when those happened, what kind of advice would you give to other aspiring leaders who might face similar challenges in their careers? That's a great question, Yulia. Um, I think we all, women here, have faced challenges and setbacks in life. I, I think this is the moment of vulnerability to acknowledge that and accept that none of us have gotten where we have without facing those challenges. And I feel that those challenges I can put in two categories. One is the challenge or setback of looking, talking, and being different than the rest, and especially in tech, right? Um, like you talked about, Carrie, we are few women in engineering. You're isolated. You have to figure your place and figure how to meld with the rest of the group so you don't stand out. Figure out how you can have a voice. So that is one challenge where you look different because you're very few in the room. Your voices are lower. If you have majority, it's easy to chime in, to speak up and share and not feel like cornered. And I think the second challenge comes when you try to do something different. So one is about looking different, one is about trying to do something different, whether it's a new process, new way of executing, new product. And again, I feel that you know, being a minority and being the 
fewer one in the room is, uh, is where we get the setback or the pushback. Um, being in, in a company, a very traditional, I think I was introduced as uh, Jupiter, it's not Jupiter, it's Juniper Networks. <laughs> and that's okay, I get that all the time. People who are not familiar with the infrastructure space do tend to call it Jupiter, it's Juniper Networks. Similar to Cisco, for those of you familiar with that. Very traditional companies. And I hear, I cannot tell you how many times I hear, this is how we do it. Right? It's a good song, but it's not a good phrase for work. <laughs> so I'm like, yes, this is how we do it. But should we rethink? Should we question the status quo? And that's where I face a lot of pushback. And in this day and age of generative AI, which Rama, you're so fortunate to be at the forefront playing with that technology every day. But we have to question the status quo. So the way I deal with these pushbacks is, is again, you know, twofold is one of the things is that do not take it personally. When you're questioned, when you're cornered, know one thing that a lot of times, I think this is also something Mary Ellen shared, that there is unconscious biases. People are very comfortable working with a certain kind of people that they're used to. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna say, you know, in technology space, a lot of, uh, you know, places, white men, they're used to working a certain way. And here comes a different voice, a person of color maybe, a person of, you know, a minority group, and they have a different way of thinking, phrasing, speaking. It is hard for them too, so I give them the benefit of doubt. That's the first thing I do. That instead of taking it personally, I assume that, you know, Maybe they just don't understand. Maybe it's, it's a good time for me to educate them, share with them, bring them up to speed with where the rest of the world is going. Hello, wake up. You know, we are, have an equal seat at the table. That's the first thing I do. And the second thing I do is take it as an opportunity to learn, you know? To instead of, okay, if I try to educate them and it did not go anywhere, that's okay. Maybe I need to figure out where else I can go, how differently can I pitch it. And I'll give you one short story about, you know, people not getting on with change or respecting that minority voice. Um, and, and my company may not like the Juniper Networks, they had a few people who want to do something very different internally. And maybe I could have given Cisco's example, but be better, but anyways, we'll stick to Juniper. And these few people stepped outside because they were not getting heard and recognition, which is the things we face. They stepped outside and took the courage to start their own company instead of getting their voice heard. And today that company is Palo Alto Networks. So it's a known fact in the industry that there were people in Juniper who could not get their way you know, had the courage. So they took that moment as a moment to reinvent themselves. So that's what we need to do. If we are not getting heard, if we are not getting the support, we get up and move. You first try to educate, and if you're not getting that way, just move, find a better place to get your words heard. So well said, um, Sulvi. Yeah, I'll share one example too. I, I'll take conflict as one of the, the, the topics to talk about because I think women, I, again, I, I don't like generalizing. You know, there are, I have seen very strong women who, who actually take charge as well. But in, in general, um, again, at the cost of uh, generalizing, uh, I would say women probably try to avoid conflict. Um, and that happens a lot in corporate world. You have to make your point, you have to stand your ground, and you have to uh, argue for it, and if you strongly believe in it. And often what happens is that when there is a very strong voice in the room, you tend to back off. And uh, you, you don't want to argue for it because you don't know how your voice will be perceived, you don't want to come across as being overtly aggressive or whatnot. So I go back to one story that um, one of my professors in, when I was doing MBA uh, told me all the time to remind myself. The story goes this way. There are two people who are fighting over an orange. There is one orange. They both see it first. One person grabs it and says, this is my orange. I'm hungry. I need to eat it. The other person says, no, I saw it. I was about to grab it. It's mine. I would like to have it. And they both are arguing for it. And that goes on for quite some time. And they, they are not able to resolve it. A mediator comes, and the mediator says, just calm down, don't talk to each other. First, ask the first person, why do you want this orange? The person says, I'm hungry, I want to eat the orange. He asks the second person, why do you want this orange? The person says, I'm a jam maker, I want the, the peel, orange peel. So it so turns out, they weren't talking to each other. If only they talked to each other about what they want, 
both of them could have gotten what they wanted. One person could have peeled and given the peel to the other one, and the other person could have had the, 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 you know, the orange slices. So it, what this story often tells me is that when you're in a, you know, in a place of conflict, in a situation of conflict, oftentimes you have to step back and ask yourself, where is that person coming from? What, is, what could be the source of conflict? Did I try to understand where that person is coming from? What is their point of view? Listen, pay attention to what the person is saying, understand your perspective, and try to find the common ground. And, and, and the common ground often doesn't have to be compromising. It could be that you know, you, you, both of you could have what you wanted. But it's about having that conversation. It's about really understanding the situation and, and imagining that you are not sitting on either side of the table trying to find a common ground, but you both are on the same side of the table sitting, looking at the whiteboard and trying to solve the problem. And I, I often go back to this story to remind myself when I'm in, in, in situations of conflict, say, there must be a reason and a point of view that they are bringing that I need to understand. And once I understand it, you can actually have a meaningful dialogue and a conversation and get your, yourself out of that conflicting situation. So I just wanted to kind of narrate one example, but there are so many things like this that in, a, in every conflicting situation or or you know, in a place where things didn't work out, you took a risk, you can always go back to finding your source of strength and figure out what the next steps are. But I, you know, it's such a broad ranging topic, I just wanted to take one example of conflict and, and uh, share a story. Thank you so much, Rama. So from what I've heard from you, so the key takeaways are, if you're in a situation of a conflict, Try to stay calm, step back, evaluate the situation. What's, why is the conflict happening? Um, understand kind of what's the thing. What is your opponent or opponents want and how you can find a compromise? And of course, then there can be situations when you can't find a compromise, when you really think that things have to be done in a different way, in the new way, and that you should also, if you feel like you, you have to challenge, you, then that you challenge. And don't take it personal. Uh, it's not about you as an individual. And you need to be also, you also need to remember that it's not about you and, 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 and who you are. But it's. You know, I just uh, wanted to add sure. to Surbhi's point that uh, some challenges are worth facing, some challenges are not. And actually, knowing when to really face the challenge and when to just walk away is just as important. And the example that you cited about, you know, you're not being heard, you, you have an idea, you're not being heard no matter what you're saying, then in that particular setting, that challenge is not worth taking. You gotta go do, take, take that challenge someplace else because just the, the timing, the circumstances, whatever is not working. So that's another lesson, I think, for all of us that, you know, some challenges are worth going for and taking and f head on facing them. Some, you just walk away because they're not worth your time. Can I just add to that for a second? I'm just gonna say, sometimes though, you just gotta call people on stuff. So I was on a panel um, about a month ago, it was a strategy panel, and they were, there were two men and two women on the panel. And, uh, uh, you know, it could have been a woman. It happened to be a man. <laughs> he was sitting next to me, and he, you know, he said something about, you know, and it's okay to disagree on panels. I think in panels it's good to do that. But he misrepresented something that I said, you know, completely. And I was sitting there and I was thinking, do I call him on it? Do I call him on it? Do I call him on it? And you know, he's the CEO of this big company in Canada and I was like, I'm gonna call him on it. And so after he commented, I said, just to be clear, that's not what I said. <laughs> and don't be afraid to take moments like that you know, as well. It, you know, sometimes it's not a consensus. Sometimes it's okay to just call people. There's a good acronym for that, dealing with a high conflict situation or communicating with someone in a conflict, BIF, be brief, informative, friendly, and firm. So you stuck, stuck up for yourself, you were friendly about it, and you got your point across. Good for you. Thank you. <laughs> so BIF, remember, next time. <laughs> okay, so carrying on our topic about empowering journeys. Um, I guess we all will agree here that empowering, like, on our empowering journeys, uh, we're not alone, we have a team. And some years ago, um, just sharing a, a story. So some years ago, um, one of my team members came, came over to me and, and, and she said that, that how much she liked our one-on-one -on -one conversation at some point because it made her feel so empowered and so encouraged and gave her so much energy that she felt like she could, you know, gonna go and change the world. 
and I felt like, well, I did something right that day. So it's really important to uh, empower people around us. So the next question is about empowering. So empowering others is a crucial aspect of leadership. Could you share an example of how you have fostered a culture of growth and empowerment within your teams and how it has impacted overall performance and innovation in your organizations? Um, we can start from Eileen. Thank you. So I'll talk about this in the context of technology innovation, since that's, of course, a huge focus of mine and my team. So COVID was a period of forced innovation. Our digital offering grew by quite a bit. We got to the point, though, where our clients were demanding more, more new solutions. We want proactive, forward-thinking solutions. We want you to come to us with ideas and trends before we even ask for them. So we created a technology innovation initiative. We call it IXC, Immersive Experience Center. And there's an entire dedicated team to furthering our IXC solutions. So we've hired around it. We've applied internal resources, internal investment to it. On my part, it required definitely some letting go. Um, I believe it was Becca earlier who was talking about, you can't know about everything that's going on, and that's OK. It's all about growing your team with, from within, giving them the power to affect change. So now what we have is an ecosystem where we have our robust digital offering, and then we have the IXC, which is constantly coming up with these new solutions that then feed into our offering, and they're focused on the next. So it's been successful. We're still figuring out a little bit how to scale it. It's a little bit, sometimes it's scary. We're like, shoot, we just won three new engagements at once. How the heck are we going to do this? But we're figuring it out, and it's super exciting, and, and we feel like we're really doing groundbreaking work as a holistic team. I'll keep it very, uh, very brief. Empowering to the teams to me is about creating a structure and, and a goal set and a goal mindset where everybody's aligned so you don't have to do micromanagement. You're empowering everybody to make day-to-day -day decisions with the knowledge where are we collectively moving. So for example, if I take the example of customer experience, the reason I was able to be successful within the company because we were setting up a horizontal practice, not trying to set up a parallel organization against everything, but just creating a strategy and set of goals that are aligned with bringing uh, customer centricity in our products, in our processes, in our people management, everything. And once you create that strategy and then charter for the company, everybody feels empowered and aligned towards that. So you're not having to go day to day and understand what each part of the business is doing, but you have just empowered your whole workforce to charge towards one goal. And I think good leaders are able to do that where they set the strategy, have the clarity of goal and clarity of a roadmap on how we are going to get there, and then just let your teams lose. Let them go and have at it and figure out different ways to achieve and achieve the success towards that goal in their own ways. So you don't have to micromanage and you really don't have to tell them day to day what to do. That's how I have been able to empower large teams. Thank you. It sounds like you really created a safe space for people to, to be empowered and, and to innovate. Um, I think within transformation, a lot of the time, you have to spend a lot of time asking people to do new things or to change the way they do things or to acknowledge that their job might be changing where they might have to take on something completely new. And it's a scary thing for people. So one of the things that I've always focused on is just creating safe spaces. And sometimes that means doing nothing or saying nothing um, as well. Uh, sometimes it's very action-oriented, but sometimes it's just, that's okay, I'm taking it in and I'm listening. Or there's a, there's a place where we can talk about that or, um, or just sort of uh, role modeling that uh, for, for others on the team um, and modeling the behaviors that, that you want to see. Um, even though you might have to give up the short-term win, um, creating that safe space is what matters even more. Uh, so that's, that's what I think about when I think about uh, empowering. Sometimes it's just those safe spaces. Did you want me to comment on? Would you like to? Yeah, sure. Um, since you all have covered good points, I'll try to share a tip that, um, that's not covered already. For me, when I go to my weekend every Friday, I look back at my week and I send one thank you note. And that thank you note is to somebody who has done outstanding work. Either it's somebody within my team or somebody I'm collaborating with who have gone ex the extra mile to do something to make the overall project successful. And that to me is empowering the other person and me 
at the same time giving so much of gratitude and satisfaction when I go to my weekend. And I cannot tell you how many times I get responses to those thank you notes from team saying, I feel, I feel so honored to have received this email and thank you for copying your man my manager on it. And now I feel so empowered to go do these kind of things out, you know, out of uh, my, going out of my way to go the extra mile to do things for you or for other teams. And that actually is, um, I found that to be a very healing um, activity that I do at the end of the week as well. When I go, when I start my Saturday, I'm feeling good about having done something, having said something nice about another person and another team member, whatever that may be. And that, that sense of gratitude heals a lot of scars that you may have experienced or ac accumulated over the, over the week. Uh, so that's a, a small tip. Empowerment, you know, all the good, good tips have been shared, but it's a very small activity that you can do. It empowers the other person to, to take on more, more, take on more, go beyond, and also makes you feel so good. Thank you. This was, this was really, really, really useful and amazing. Like, remember, to create immersive experience for your, for your colleagues and for people who, whom you work with, uh, to listen to them, to acknowledge them and to, to appreciate them. I think that's amazing. And give them opportunities to, to show and express how amazing they are at what they do. Um, since we, have, we are moving very <laughs> actively into the direction of inno innovation and how how creativity innovation um, drives our companies forward. Um, so the next question is um, specifically about driving innovation. And I would maybe start with Serbi and maybe Rama if, or anybody else who wants to pick up. Uh, could you share an example of how you drove innovation within the organizations, especially when it comes to machine learning, artificial intelligence, or generative AI, or any other cutting edge technology? Oh, yeah, I can go. Um, innovation is at the core of everything that, uh, that we do. Uh, so some of the things that we have done that worked really well, uh, especially uh, when it comes to com coming up with something new. When you have a very good ongoing project and you know exactly what you need to do, you know, you're building a product, you know what next set of features that you need to build and such, it kind of goes in a, in a particular rhythm. Uh, however, what, uh, and within that scope of what you're building, likely you will be innovating and such. But I think big moments of innovation come often when you are in periods of transition. Let's say you are you are you finished a product, um, you know, major release it, and you've transitioned it over to somebody, and you have to start something new. Like how Surbi, you were saying, you were given a new job, um, and you don't know much about that space, and you you are learning so much in the the initial few weeks and months, and you're putting the team together, and you have to figure out where the next where the puck will be. What what is the new product that you will build? What is the new idea? And for that. For, for, for coming up with ideas and, 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 and creative minds, you know, the, what, the best thing is, first of all, you have to have to hire the right people. People with the right mindset, people who are creative, people who have the right set of skills to come up with something new. Once you hire them, then you, you set the right kind of goals and what you want and you let them lose. And you, that, that's where, you know, a lot of brainstorming, you know, there are times when, during the transitions, when you are trying to create something new, we gather, and this was pre-COVID and now post-COVID, I do the same with my team. We gather in, in rooms, that's it, physical rooms with whiteboards, and we are brainstorming. And we are you know, just building on each other's ideas, and that is how new ideas come about. So a lot of, lot of just physically being there, hanging out in labs and, and collaborating and building on each other's ideas. Reading a lot, that's a, a very important aspect of innovating because a lot, oftentimes you think, um, you have an idea that's new, but the, the industry and the field of AI especially is moving so fast. So unless you're constantly reading the literature, what's the latest that's coming up, what's, what's new, what's new in startup world, what's new in the research world, you, you don't know what, whether you're coming up with something new or you're reinventing something that somebody already has done. So there is a huge part of being innovative is, is, is about staying up to speed and learning. So, you know, with my team, we, we often do this. We pick out some you know, latest papers that we have to read or blog articles that we have to read or 
uh, things that we have to just come up to speed on. And then we discuss. We discuss those things as to, OK, where are the white spaces? If they are working on this, where are the gaps? Where, where can we add value, given our team's strengths? So a lot of these types of things where you, you have to read, you have to have the right people, you have to create the right kind of brainstorming, innovative spaces where they have the time. If you put a lot of pressure and say, you know, by tomorrow you come up with a brilliant idea, that won't happen. Oftentimes, it's, you, you come up with something and then you have to keep on pivoting. You, you, you learn something, you do mini prototypes, you learn from that and you pivot and you make the necessary course correction adjustment and keep going that way. Uh, so the, yeah, these are some other things that we do. I can give a quick example, and then I'll hand the mic back to Serbi. So we um, recently launched a website for our IXC initiative, and we used AI across design, copywriting, development, which is not uncommon. I'm sure many of us in the room have done so. What we found, though, with the launch of this website and the application of generative AI were two key takeaways. The first is that the AI is not enough on its own. The critical thought paired with the AI is still incredibly important. Perhaps at some point we'll get to a point where the AI is sophisticated enough that you don't have to necessarily finesse the outcome, but we're not, we're not there. And I would argue that I hope we never will be because that element of human thought is, is always so valuable. And the second takeaway was we estimated that we saved about 100 man hours using AI for various coding challenges, copywriting challenges, et cetera. So our clients immediately jumped to, that's fantastic. You're going to save us all this money. What we were able to do with those 100 manpower hours saved via AI was to ultimately create a more sophisticated end product. So our art director, for example, who was using Midjourney to create this beautiful 3D imagery was then able to take that saved time and use it on other things, zhuzhing up the rest of the site, bringing in design sophistication throughout. And so ultimately, we ended up with a much better product through the specific use of AI. Good points. Uh, so for me, innovation is, since I come from a product management background, was always about, oh, new products. You want to build completely new categories, do new things. But as I have taken on this customer experience role, I have realized and I've learned and I've put it into action is that innovation is also about doing the same thing a different way, more efficient way, faster way. So the, the ability to question status quo is, I would say, is the most critical thing in ability to innovate. To be able to innovate, you have to have a culture in, a, in an organization, in a company, where you're able to question each other without the fear of retaliation. Like you were talking about safe spaces, I think innovation needs a safe space where you're okay to try and fail. It's okay, the generative AI has given us so many use cases and I'll talk specifically about customer experience where all the way from you know, your pre-sales marketing time to your pre-sales uh, engagements, inside sales uh, representatives to your GTM motion to post-sales, everywhere there's ability to innovate and come up with new ways of doing things which we have not done before. And the way you do that innovation in your industry or in your spaces, in your companies, is giving your teams the ability to try things and be okay when they fail. Uh, if you're okay with failure and take it as a way to learn, you build the ability to innovate. And everything that Rama said, of course, how you do that innovation, how you brainstorm, and all of that is great. But to set that environment and that culture is extremely important. And Yulia, I'm, I'm going to turn this question back to you, because yesterday when we were talking about innovation, you were sharing some amazing ideas that you have had. So what, if you can share your thoughts here. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to build on what you said, Serbi, just for one second, and then we'll go to Yulia, because I like your idea of putting her on the spot. Um, so, yeah, just one, from a technology, from an executive perspective, what I would say is that it's very important, you know, just building on what you said, to, to give people a bubble that they can innovate in, a protected bubble, so that they have the, the time uh, and the resources to do that innovation if you want it to really be successful. Yes, you can be innovative in, in lots of different ways, but if you want to be serious about, about that piece, that bit of innovation, what I've always found successful is, you know, either you have a day or two days or it's a whole team for a year that's protected within the innovation that they're building. And that's what the executives need to do to show that they're serious about innovation or encouraging that innovation uh, in a company. Thank you. So, have... If I, if I may summarize, before I, before I jump into my response to the same question, I'm going to summarize what I've just heard. So essential key for innovation would be to, um, basically before you transition between building new innovative products, you need to gather your team in person, ideally, and brainstorm, write your ideas on the whiteboard, and do lots of readings so you stay up to, up to date with the recent technology. And you should and adopt it 
together with applying critical thinking, whether this or that is the right thing to do. Um, you also need to create safe space for your team to fail fast. So they try something, then fail fast. Maybe next time it will, it will fly, it will be great. And, and of course, investment, innovation is really important. How much companies invest into innovating. Um, and now since Suri put me on the spot, <laughs> I can maybe say a few things also. So um, maybe a couple of years ago, I spoke with my friend about a very similar topic. And we made a little questionnaire uh, of different startups whom, we, whom she knew and I knew. And we asked them, how, how, what's the percentage of their innovation that is successful and what were the aspects of that? And they said that they thought about it, they were like, mm, well, you know, maybe about seven, five, seven percent of what we do is actually successful. And, and they were like, well, explain how this is, this is working out. And they said, well, it's working out because we, we speak with our product team, we know our customers, know their pain points. And, and then we asked them, well, how, how much would it be successful if you were just doing it by yourself without understanding, you know, the customer side? And they said, well, <laughs> well, maybe 0 0.1, <laughs> maybe less than, maybe like almost nothing, because we, we innovate, but we keep in mind how it will transform experience of our customers, of the end user society. So that's the, one of the important drivers for innovation. But now Carol gives me a sign that it is time for the questions. So um, please raise your hands. Uh, we have this amazing panel over here, and they're ready to take any of your questions. There is a couple of hands, or oh, three hands over there. There's one. Hi, Woo. Emily from Canada, also. Um, question for you is the pace of change organizationally is not necessarily keeping the pace of change with senior thought leadership. How do you educate up or laterally when they're not really understanding where the organization needs to go or where technology is taking the organization without creating direct conflict but also achieving the ultimate goal or outcome? Sorry, so, sorry, I just want to make sure I understood the question. So the question was, how do you ensure that there's good communication or facilitation so that there's a, the pace of change remains reasonable? So between sort of where, this, where, where the senior executives might be versus sort of where the rest of the organization is? The rest of technology is moving. I think the question is tech is moving really fast. And how do you influence your leadership to keep pace with it and continue iterating very fast? Yeah. And, and I'll just... Answer. I think it depends on the company and the company culture a lot, um, and what stage the company is. If it has, you know, mature products that are very hard to iterate and morph into, let's say, Gen AI. So I'll, I'll give you the example of all infrastructure companies. It's very hard to incorporate Gen AI into very mature products, like whether it's in compute or networking or storage, versus into processes. So you have to, like I think Rama was saying, you have to be very aware of how technology is changing and be able to have that understanding, where can I make that change? Whether it's in products or processes or my hiring, there are many, many places that tech can have an impact. And as a leader, you have to have that understanding first and then be able to influence your leadership. And the best thing I use is, is data. If the competition is going there, I have the way to influence them. If the customers are demanding it, I have the way to influence them. So you have to build your, your you know, need cycle through competitive analysis, through your customer recommendations, et cetera. Um, I'll say you know, there has to be forums in companies for both top-down and bottom-up. Because the technology is changing so fast, sometimes scientists are actually ahead of wh where the industry is. So you, there has to be a forum where upper management and business leaders are able to listen to your scientists and engineers on the ground of new ideas that, that will propel you with new products that you can bring that nobody else has in invented or innovated. Similarly, top leadership sometimes have to make some changes in, and pivots 
So the, the engineers on the ground needs to be able to take that direction and, and understand why that's happening and that means it has to percolate through all the layers in the organization. That means you can never communicate enough. It has to be communication, communication, communication. It has to come down through all of the staff meetings from business leaders to mid-level managers to first-line managers uh, and so on. So I think the critical thing is that these communication forums have to be very open. I'll tell you one thing that's very interesting at NVIDIA I've seen. Jensen Huang, who is the CEO, encourages the entire company to write what is called top five things, what they're working on. Anybody could write, business leaders, engineers, hardware chip designers, anybody, product managers, and they can copy him. And he will read at the, be at the beginning of the day hundreds of these top five things. So by just taking statistical sampling of all the things that people are working on and what they are saying and the insights, he is able to formulate and get an idea of what's, what's the pulse of the company. And similarly, they copy everybody else, so you get an idea of what others are working on. You get some sales ones, you get some research ones, and everybody in the organization is having a conversation with each other about these ideas, and you can start responding on that email thread. So you have to have forums like that. I thought that was very fascinating when I came to NVIDIA. Forums that allow you to have that kind of meaningful conversation up and down the chain without any inhibitions. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm, I, I get a sign off from the organizers. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll take responsibility. Sorry, Carol. We have one more question. We're going to take one more question. <laughs> well, we have one, two. Who was first? I'm, I'm not sure. And we'd love to chat more at the, at the networking yeah. at 430 as well. So don't feel like you have to get all your questions in right now. Oh, um, hello, this is Judy from LinkedIn, who is leading generative AI initiatives. I have a question uh, regarding the, uh, like Rama mentioned about top two or three things for generative AI, especially for large enterprise companies. In order to make it successful, what are the top two or three things that you believe that are really critical for companies who really want to unlock the power of Gen AI? Thank you. I think having an understanding of first what problem you have at hand and whether there is a good ca use case for that, you know, can you leverage generative AI for it? So you have to know that match. And these days actually pretty much Every use case that you can think of in business is a, is, is a pretty good candidate, but how far you can go with it is something that you have to understand because there are still problems that require more traditional uh, problem solving or, or traditional more statistical machine learning as opposed to generative AI. Like anomaly detection is a very good example where you still have to build you know, by processing a lot of data, actually hardcore you know, algorithms may not be you can just send thousands and thousands of uh, or millions of logs and, and ask generative AI models to detect anomalies. You know, they're not there yet. So understanding where the good match is uh, and, and, and then you can just go at it. You know, have those safe spaces as, as people said. Just have everybody go build those small pro proof of concepts, large language model based workflows and try them out and see and then figure out how to how to incorporate them. One thing I would say is there, is there is one thing to build. Building is easy with generative AI, but when, you ha when it comes to deployment, you have to think about so many things about security, guardrails, and ethics around it. And So d don't ever underestimate just because now the building cycles have, have sped up that uh, you can just deploy. The, the test cycles are very long, and all the things around guard railing, ethics, and guard safeguarding the data privacy and, 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 and data, are long cycles, so take that into account as you're experimenting, exploring, and applying, and deploying. If I can just add one last thing, I think one area that I see every company focusing on is customer support. And, and I can talk to you offline, I don't wanna take any more time, but customer support, every company should be investing in Gen AI in that space.